Possession crucial from this. How much longer will the referee allow? Dublin lead by a goal. Oh, there's the whistle. It's over. It's over. We earned it by winning the last two matches on the road, and that's not going to be taken away from us. But what I love in Hurland, I love players that will never give in. He hits it. He hits it. Wow. It's over the bar. Hello and welcome along to the RTE GA podcast. I'm Mikey Stafford and I am joined this week by Rory O'Neill, Ushi McConville and Donald Cusick. How are you doing, lads? Mikey, how are things? Mikey, lads, how are things? Good. Now, so later I'll be talking to Joan Henshi, the New York chairperson, about um, their efforts to get back up and running in what was the epicentre of a global pandemic. Talk to her about other things, visas. Uh, Donald Trump even gets mentioned, so it's a good chat. Worth hanging around for. But now we are going to... Uh, have a look at matters closer to home. Now, GA activity ground to a halt in early March as the coronavirus pandemic hit our shores, and all focus turned to flattening the curve and preparing for the surge. Then things began to lift, and we could see light at the end of the tunnel. However, on 11th of May, the GA president, John Horne, went on the Sunday game and cast serious doubt on the prospect of any GA action in 2020. Then, less than a month later, the GA released its roadmap for a return to club act- uh, training on the 29th of June. Uh, with intercounty training on the 14th of September and intercounty competitions a month later. We've subsequently had uh, these dates brought forward even further as the government merged some phases, and now we have club and intercounty fixtures arranged across the island. This is what we yearned for in the darkest times, yet we're not happy. Rows are springing up everywhere club v county, CPA v GAA, everyone v the GPA. Camogie Association v their minor players, London ladies footballers v the LGFA. I've personally heard talk of legal action for defamation. We've accusations being made on radio and in print. Oshin, why can't we all just get along? That's, a, that's, that's what I thought. And I think Joan Horn, first of all, used that tactic that a lot of lawyers use on, uh, on very prominent Netflix shows, whereas um, tell people the worst and then give them a little bit and they'll think you're the best in the world. And I think when I heard the news that we were going to have some sort of GAA uh, I was jumping up and down, but we do like a moan, and uh, and issues started to arise. And um, I, my personal, um, as far as the personal impact of me, okay. So I am uh, managing a club team in Monaghan. Um, I've had more conversations with Seamus McEnany um, in the last couple of weeks than I've ever had, <laughs> and I think it's been more amicable because I think it has to be. And I think, you know, a lot of the rhetoric that I've heard around the country is that, you know, there's a serious problem between inter-county managers and clubs. Uh, I've found it sort of flipped on its head for me in that um, the lines of communication have been open. And uh, I think reading the article that uh, Mike Quark wrote, and I know Mike quite well, uh, I'm going to have to ring him and tell him he needs to get training quickly because everybody else, <laughs> everybody else is training. Uh, and if Leach are the only team in the country that's not training, then they're in for a mighty fall because, as I say, you know, the lanes of communication, in, uh, in my regard, has been, they have been opened up. And when the lanes of communication are opened up between inter-county managers and clubs, I think it's all for, the, all for the better. I'm not going to agree all the time, and there has to be tweaks and little things, but the very fact that um, Seamus McGinney takes time out to, to phone around you know, uh, club managers and, and make sure that the load is not too heavy on the inter-county player, rather than us all living in a fantasy world where inter-county teams are not training. I mean, come on, somebody give me a break. I mean, it, the, that was never, ever going to happen, and, and nor should it. But as long as we can um, get to some sort of agreement that's amicable, as I say, for both the inter-county players' management and then to bring the clubs into account as well. Oshin, it's nice to hear you actually go on the record and say that you were aware that the county team in the uh, county where you're managing a club are training. Because what we've had so far is lots of, I've heard a county, I'm not going to name them, are training, etc., etc. And then most people, I think, don't log most realistic people with an interest in GEA, be a club or county, are probably quite accepting of the fact that county teams are going to go back training. That's what they do. They train and it's up to the county managers, county board and those clubs to arrange 
how they train. I don't think it's that shocking that county teams are training at the moment, do you? Yeah, well, look, I think we all know, right, there's a, there's a fixtures challenge within the association and players, coaches, everybody wants certainty. But, like, the, I didn't start or, 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 or finish playing in the county to, today or yesterday, right? And it's, it's always been an issue. Um, and, like, there are complications, okay, and there are challenges. But you, I would say as well, humans have solved bigger problems. But, like, you have to admit it. Like, look at the differences that exist. You've got big clubs in Dublin compared to tiny rural clubs. You've different codes. You've county versus club teams. You've divisional teams in Cork. Like, even within clubs, you have... I, I heard a story about a club in East Cork lately who stopped their, uh, their minor players training with the, with, with the minor team and wanted them playing with the senior team. And, like, I'm very interested in hearing what O'Sheen is talking about there because, like, a lot of... GA people, I've been, I've been down our own field every day since last Sunday, right, be that training with the, uh, the senior team or training underage teams, and I've been talking to the, the chairman, the vice chairman, and there's been no discussion around the, the county versus club issue, everybody is just focused on getting things up and going and getting the, the, the community going, and getting the games going and focused on, the, on their own challenges. And like, you know, I wonder is there seems to be a real desire amongst pundits <laughs> and yeah, for there to be an issue here. And I just wonder, is there a bit like of, you know, is there a majority and uh, a silent majority that don't really see this as anything new or that it's really a burning uh, issue in, in getting things moving in the GA again and through, through a bit of common sense and compromise. Like I said, this is going on for day that. I think that, that the whole thing can be, can be cared for. Uh, so, Rory, you're the media. It's you. Yeah. It's you. you. You're the man who appoints pundits. You're the man who picks pundits. It's all you. I I, to be honest, I wouldn't necessarily disagree with Don Log uh, to a large extent. I think sometimes... The paper paper never refuses ink. That's the, I suppose that's one aspect of it. But I often... I do find it kind of slightly amusing at times that when club this club versus county thing is pitched like there's two camps pitched up against each other and you're saying to yourself well who's actually pitching this as a standoff and by and large or invariably it does tend to be media types like me and then you kind of have to say well like how much of how how, how hypocritical is that when it is someone like me will say that makes its entire living from the inter-county game and would be pitching against the inter... You know, I, like there is a sort of a perception, I think, that's gone out there. Um, and I think it has been, I suppose, trumpeted in the media by and large that county bad, club good. Club is something pure and beautiful and the county is the, the corporate and the elite. And I'm not too... I, I find that quite nauseous to be honest and I'm, I don't know how it started where it began why it is why it is what it is but I think it's something that probably should be addressed how do you do it I have no idea mm. but it just seems it seems counterproductive to me Oshin, yeah, you're, you're probably so, sorry Mikey I'm just going to say to Oshin that, uh, on that point about the you know club good uh, county bad of, of, of you know the great footballers of the last 50 years there's very few I would say who most people probably conjure a picture of them in their club jersey before they do in their county jersey to me you're one of those people I picture you in a cross the Glen jersey before I picture you in an Armagh jersey don't ask me why so you invariably have a foot in both camps as all inter-county players do they're all club players as well what do you make do, do you sense that do you think it's something that's grown since your time playing with cross the Glen is it again just a media invention or is there actually some kind of groundswell out there that people are trying to protect the grassroots against the semi-professional, you know, you know, um, resource grabbing intercounty game? Well, I suppose first and foremost, the thing that I would see a lot from uh, the general public that you be speaking to is that, you know, the, the county game is the big bad wolf. Okay. So I think there was a huge celebration whenever everybody thought, well, put club first because I've been hearing that from the last three, four, five presidents put club first that probably hasn't happened put club first when I played with Armagh 
we had a serious issue between uh, between the county and the club because the county wanted us to play a national league and we were preparing for an all an all Ireland semi final or final. And uh, you know, I remember one year we played in the Fina in Dublin. Uh, Keo McGinney was in the other team. He was and Desi Farr was playing and Jason Sherlock and a few others. Uh, for Nafina, they all played National League. <laughs> all of us didn't. You know, all the crossboys didn't. And that created a, a huge issue. Giza was playing with uh, Nafina at the time, and he was playing uh, inter county National League with Armagh. That caused a huge rift. And, uh, and that rift went on for some time. And so, in fact, some people may, would probably say that the semblance of, of that rift is, is still hanging around there. But a lot of this comes down to comes back to personal choice. Like you look at David Goff and you look at Jack McCaffrey and they're up now. So that's a personal choice thing. But in general, the GAA is about personal personal choice and whether you want to go and you want to play under county players or you want to play under county football or you want to play under county hurling. Because I played with lads at underage who were definitely better than me as a footballer but didn't want to commit and go on and be in Intercounty. Because it's easier to talk about it. It's a lot easier to talk about being an Intercounty footballer or a hurler than it is to actually be that. Uh, I feel sorry for a lot of Intercounty players, the genuine Intercounty players who are caught in the middle of all this. And that's what I found myself in uh, in the late 90s and early 2000s. We found ourselves caught in the middle of this, forced to make a choice between club and county. First of all, I've always thought that they can coexist without any major issues if people just sit down and talk about it. I mean, like, I deal with inter-county players who are at college level who are playing inter-county college and are getting dragged away by clubs or under-21s or whatever. And do you know what? The sensible people, which, are, which is 90% of the people who are managing teams, the sensible people would sit down and have a conversation because... If, if I have a guy who's training seven days a week, probably no good to me. And everybody, want, everybody has wanted that little pound of flesh. I think in that regard, things have improved. But as far as uh, perception of uh, what is going on with the inter-county game, while wow, we're in a bad place press-wise, um, I think that a lot, of, a lot of people who are, you know, a lot of people that I meet will, will repeat verbatim what has got, what has been written in an article at the weekend and that they will take that as that is their opinion of what's going on whereas if you delve a little bit deeper into that uh, I think you can um, you can be a very good intercounty player and you can be still very committed to your club there are, there are a few exceptions to that. There are a few lads who, who really have no interest in playing with their club. And, and, but those gays, thankfully, are few and far between. A lot of, the majority of gays who are playing in the county football or hurling uh, are very keen to play with their club and do not want to be caught in the middle of, of what's going on at the moment. If, we're, if you're talking about, like, this is partly a matter of perception, Donald Logue, I'm interested in what you think of how the GPA have conducted themselves and because they seem to become a bit of a lightning rod as well they've become and maybe maybe that's on purpose maybe they want to be that you know they want to be that umbrella body that people can attack instead of attacking players because I haven't heard anybody speaking out against a GA player but the GPA have said that there's a sustained negative discourse surrounding inter-county players and they're walking a bit of a tightrope saying no you shouldn't go back training before the 14th of September but we want to make sure that there's insurance cover if you do. That's a very difficult tightrope to walk. And I'm just curious, like, did you envisage the GPA getting involved in fights, arguments like this? And how do you think it's going for them at the moment? Yeah, well, just, just Mikey, I'm actually president of the, the GPA, right? Oh, sorry. It's, sorry, it's yes. very, very much an, an honorary role, yeah. right? Uh, you're correct. I was uh, involved for, for many, many years. Uh, as chairman and, and, and served in, in different roles and extremely proud uh, to be president and, and proud of, of my time um, uh, working for the players through, through the, the, the GPA. But like, what I would say is that the, like, and, and, and I'll get to that, right, in terms of that specific question, but the, it's just, it's, I think Rory touched on something there, that there's, 
there's this kind of a, a, a perception being put out there that in some way the club player is almost holier than the inter-county player. But like it's, I, I would argue, you know, and, and, and maybe it's not popular at the moment, right, to be making those arguments, but the, the county game is every bit as integral and a historically component to the GA as the club game. Like, and it's, it's vital in terms of showcasing our games, the provision of an elite arena for our players. Like, what do we want to say that we don't have an elite arena involved in our association, so you should go away playing other sports? I think absolutely we should be catering for the elite aspect of our sport and be, and be proud of it. And I would argue that the county is as essential as the club themselves in terms of the unifying effect on communities and even the sense of pride in place that it offers. Like it's, and then not to mention the income for building grounds, the grants, the coaching officers. I think you touched on it there, the, the lakes, the heroes. We know how important that is to the, to the game. The lads to present medals at the end of the year. And Rory, you said it, a lot of the people who are making the most noise at the moment are actually people who make money are trying to make money on the backs of these very same players. And I do think we need to be very careful because if some of these people have their way, the GLB is anonymous as the League of Ireland B. So like, <laughs> very careful in terms of that whole territory, right? And like what I would say about the GPA is that, you know, I hear, uh, you know, being said over the years about, uh, you know, the, the image of the, the, the GPA and it being a lightning rod and so on like that. And, but like, it was not, it's not about the image of the GPA for me. Like, the GPA is about helping its players have a proper life and sports career balance. And, like, I know that might sound like buzzwords, but if that's your life, that balance is hugely important. It's about making sure the players were treated with dignity and respect and care, right? Nobody suffers in their life for playing the games that the players are ready to transition into life after the games, that they can pick up their career and offer leadership in clubs. And like O'Sheen touched on it there, we talk about offering leadership in clubs. I was part of a, of a group in the mid-2000s who were on the, at the vanguard and very proud of what we did for, for player welfare. But when I think back on those guys, like if I even look at that team, right, and if I think of Dermot O'Sullivan, Dermot Sullivan has been involved with numerous underage teams, with club and with county. He's still playing senior hurling for a time, and he's involved in coaching the Cork senior hurling team. Pat Mulcahy, Newtown Sandrum, CIT, whole wide range of teams. On the other side, Wayne Sherlock, cornerback, has been involved with the Black Rock underage teams over the last couple of years. Also involved in under 15 and under 16 Cork teams. Sean Oog, Sean Oog helped me been involved with UCC freshers, giving loads of time to, to young lads who are coming into the into UCC from all over Ireland. Been involved with Napierschig, is involved with the Cork Miners and myself now. Ronan Curran, centre back, was coaching the Bears over the last couple of years. So like all these all these players who yeah believe in terms of players being looked after and, and so on. All of these players go back and give to the to the clubs in the main. All right, in the very main. I actually know very few. I find it hard actually to, to call out some player that I played with that actually isn't given back into the, uh, into the association. But like in terms of the GPA, and, and I think the GPA's position is, is clear in, in, in what they're, they're, they're speaking about. They were part of the committee that decided the game shouldn't go back until the 14th of September. Obviously, within that committee, there was a lot of compromise and give and take had to be given by a whole wide range of stakeholders involved in, in the association. Now, what they're saying is that if a player is knocked out before the 14th, surely it's okay for that player to go back training at the county. What do you want? Him not to go back training? And then, if he is going back training, that the player is insured, what do we want? Are players not to be insured? Mm. Given Given the fact that Oshin has, you know, finally had the cat out of the bag and, you know, said that counties are training, we know they are, we know Monaghan are training, we all know that there's counties all over the country that are training. Do you think, given injury load, given, you know, the, you know too much training is bad, we see Bundesliga injuries go from 0.27 to 0.88 a game, 
do you think the GPA should have just come out, Donald Logan said, no, let's stand firm here. Let's, let's stick to the GA's plan and say 14th of September and advise your members not to train before the 14th of September. Is that something the GPA should have considered? Look, I think everybody's conscious of that, right, in terms of workload and stuff like that. But I'd be very surprised if O'Sheen's organisation that he was running with his team wasn't absolutely professional and totally conscious in terms of the workload that aren't players. Mm -hmm. And I do get, I can imagine, you could say the same for the Bundesliga. You can only imagine the, the resources that they would have around it and that injuries ha have risen and stuff like that. But I, I think from what I see mostly at, at inter-county level and people that are responsible for teams, and I actually see it in club teams, I'm looking after my own minor club team down in time and their strength and conditioning guys who are in charge of it. And their fundamental top priority is to look after the loading of the player and that, in, in any way. And I tell you, that's a lot different to when it was back in the mid-90s and stuff like that, some of the, some of the, some of the training that we, 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 we were all going through. But back to the, to the GPA point, like the GPA doesn't govern the association. The GPA is not in the business of sanctioning uh, players or county boards. If, if counties are back training, then that problem is with the county board. The GA need to take the, take the county boards to task. The GPA's focus is on all of the areas that I spoke about already. Mm. Rory, the, uh, in all this, the, the, the CPA, who have kind of taken quite a militant approach on a lot of things, and I think nobody disagrees with their, their core aim, which is, you know, fix the fixtures, and uh, it's a noble cause, and it's damn near impossible. Uh, they've been very vocal in the last couple of weeks. So just, what, do you think it's been helpful, their, their uh, intrusions thus far? No, no, not, not at all. And um, <clears throat> sometimes, I, I, like, with all of this, I do get a kind of a sense, and I don't want to be a harbinger of doom here, but there is, a, there is the very real potential, because we're seeing spikes all around the world. There is the, ver there is the very real potential for a second wave, right? And if a second wave were to come, what you're effectively left with then is, a, is, is akin to two bald men fighting over a comb. Because that's a, cause, cause what, we've, what we've ended up having here is, is potentially a row about something that may not ever occur. Because you would imagine if a second wave does rock up onto the scene, then the club will be pulled. And I can't really see an env or envisage an inter-county, you know, packing in grounds and you just can't see that happening. So, I, I, like, I suppose maybe in a wider context, and this kind of goes back to what we spoke about yesterday in the lead up to this, when you see words like civil war being used in the Irish Times and then the Club Players Association, as you said, coming in, looking to try and, you know, plant their flag, all very unhelpful. And I'm, t I'm, t I'm saying to myself, but all possibly very needless as well, you know, and unnecessary. And it could all become all all become very moot if 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 things transpire the way we don't want them to work out. So yeah, yeah I just you, I would just hope that everybody mm. like what what the one thing that I hoped for in in a pandemic was that context would be like people would develop context and would realize look you know that we all just need to you know take a, a, a sort sense of, a, of ma making do. Yeah, but like, but I think what's actually happened, and maybe this kind of possibly feeds into what's happening with the Black Lives Matter movement in terms of the numbers of people. I think when people have nothing to do, they will, you know, I think, I think the, the, the sooner we get people back on pitches, training and managing, the, 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 the quicker the row, the, all the rows will stop. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's an analogy. Uh, um, sorry, sorry, yeah. Yeah, Oshin, um the, you, you're painting a picture of a relatively harmonious situation in Monaghan. I'm wondering what... It won't be, it won't be harmonious now that I've let the cat out of the bag. <laughs> <laughs> we trusted you, McConville. We trusted oh. you. Um, but do you think it was necessary for the GA to come in and say, you know, issue sanctions? Supposedly there are sanctions, you know, bringing the association into disrepute or something. There are sanctions already in the books that could have worked if they had wanted to lay the hammer down and say to a county board, if your county team, if you can't keep control of your county team and stop them from training before the 14th of September, we will sanction you. Do you think that should have been done? Was it necessary or would that have 
call it, pour petrol on a fire. Well, here's the thing: if if you're gonna, you know, if you're gonna tell counties to do something, if you're gonna make a rule, then it's best to follow through on that. It's absolutely half arsed Okay, what what has happened uh, as far as you know, winter county teams going back? Because believe me, if you were sitting in that room with that committee, I can guarantee you, every single person in that room knew that inter-county teams were not going to sit on their hands on the 14th of September. And nor should you expect them to. You know, it's a knockout competition. I mean, they, like they've, got, they've got two league games. They need to hit the ground running. The best way to hit the ground running is to get some preparation on. Um, and I think, you know, if the, G, if the GA were going to bring in this rule, well then yes, there, there should have been sanctions. But there's not. And, and as a result of that, uh, all you have to do is look, and I think it was this morning where I read all the different dates of the inter- of the county finals, and you look at you look at counties walking with the county, you look at the counties walking against the county. Believe it or not, they're inter county teams, and then you look at the ones in the middle where there's a little bit of compromise from both sides. And for me, you know, they're the ones who will who will come out of this. And I, as far as I'm concerned, with a little bit of kudos, rather than the gays who, I mean, Wexford seem to be playing their championship in over a weekend in, in July or something. <laughs> uh, and then there's the opposite end of that scale where Derry are going right to the, Derry and, and Leach seem to be going right to the, to the end of, 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 yeah. Yeah, of, the, of, what, what, of the amount of time they've, they've been allocated. Um, but somewhere in the middle, there's a compromise there. And I think when people see comp- compromise, um, then everybody is willing to give that a little bit more. And uh, you know, when the clubs aren't being screwed over or the inter-county team is not being screwed over and there's a little bit of, I already talked about it, give and take, then um, that's for the betterment of, 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 uh, of both the club game and inter-county game. At a time where I find it very difficult to ridicule because, as I say, I'm just delighted that we're getting some sort of... Uh, some sort of action. And the last point, point on, on the sanctions thing is we've talked about the illegal payments to managers for years. <laughs> and we, we've, never sank, we've never sanctioned it. And, and again, we know what's going on, but we've never sanctioned it. So, uh, you know, where's the deterrent there? I mean, so like the, it, it's a little bit along the same lines as that for me. Yeah, Don Logie, it's not the GPA's job to, to um, administrate, and that's very true. Do you think the GEA should have brought in sanctions to prevent county training before 14th September? I tell you, I, I'm with Oshin on this, right? That it's, it, I, I think it's about common sense and compromise. Like every, we, we've gone through a pandemic, right? We all want to get back out onto the field, onto the grass, see games, let our players out in the field, let people hopefully, hopefully a, 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 attend games. I think common sense and a bit of compromise all of this can can, uh, can can work out, and it was interesting. Like it was another, it's another interesting one that's that hasn't been brought into the mix. But when when Oshin said it there, I was um, it, I, I was involved in a conversation with a, an intercounty manager this week, and he was raising the point around, but you know, people are talking about advantages and disadvantages, and some of the people who are making a lot of noise are actually they're paid, obviously, inter- intercounty managers. So, like, is, is that an advantage? Is that a disadvantage? Is the conversation different in those counties when you're actually uh, paid or under some sort of contract compared to other counties where, uh, where, where, where everybody is volunteering in, in, in that position? So, um, I think it's, it's, it's just an interesting one as part of that discussion. But unless I'm missing something, like I said, I was down the club every day this week, right? Like loads of other people, talking to lots of people around the club. I'm not so sure that for the majority, this is as big an issue as is being made out by some pundits and, and uh, members of the media. Is Am there... I the media, Rory? Just a second. <laughs> but I, 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 would, I would actually agree. I mean, I, but I think, I think it's, not a, it's not as big. Like, for instance, in the club I'm in, Don Bate here in North County Dublin, it's certainly not uh, being spoken of. But what is being spoken of is another row because they're, you know, the club players uh, feel that the Dublin County Board 
fixed three champions. Sorry, uh, they're running a championship with no promotion and no relegation, um, and no league. So effectively, you will get a minimum and potentially maximum of three championship matches, but no promotion or relegation. So if you take the senior football championship, senior one out of it, where there is no promotion, because obviously that's the top grade, all of the other competitions where promotion and relegation has been removed from, they effectively become glorified, a bunch of glorified, glorified challenge matches. But I know and that, that's not to knock the Dublin County Board. Again, they're in a situation like everybody else where there has to be an element of give and take. But it'll give you an indication, I suppose, really on what's consuming people's minds and thoughts. It certainly isn't whether or not Dermot Connolly is going to tag out for Vincent's or play with, you know, or play or, or, be, or be with Desi Farrell. It's, you know, I think the national media sometimes focuses on things that might not necessarily be as prevalent on at grassroots level in terms of the conversation. Can I look at a, a, a good news story or a potential good news story, Oshin, that, um, Please. That, that's there? I know it's, it's a novel idea. Uh, this idea, this shorter, very defined season where there's club players all over the, uh, all over the country. And let's not be elitist. Let's, let's look at your intermediate, your junior, junior A, your junior B. I, for my sins, am going to play junior B hurling in Greystones. I haven't played hurling in 20 years, but I've got oh, some kind of Celtic revival thing going on. And I'm in a WhatsApp group with a bunch of lads I've never met because they haven't trained. You have yet. to shave first. I I got a big helmet. I put it on. It's fine. Um, so I'm in the WhatsApp group with a bunch of lads I've never met because they haven't trained yet because it's junior B hurling. And you get a sense from some of them that, geez, we know our fixtures. We're playing six matches in six weeks. This is great. I think I'll go back and play this year. So there's there's clearly guys who haven't left the WhatsApp group who are planning on retiring, who aren't going to retire now because they said. Jesus, we're playing six matches in a month and a half. That sounds like fun. And I'm hearing this from other people anecdotally around the country that a shorter defined season may actually be quite an attractive thing for a lot of club players. Absolutely. And, and even just knowing you know, the fact that games are going to come thick and fast, players love that. I mean, I see Don Logan on his head there. I, like, I wasn't somebody who loved training. I trained because that was part of the deal to get playing at the weekend. And, uh, and I think, you know, club players definitely love that. I'd love to clear the fine season. And one more thing on that. I think we have stumbled across something here which the GA should look at as far as fixtures is concerned. I think playing inter-county football later in the year I think is something that may help solve the issue with uh, with fixtures. Yeah. I think you're spot on. I think you're spot on, Ush. I actually was th- I was thinking about that as well the other day, and I've actually no, I don't, I wouldn't necessarily be in favour of cramming it all into seven weeks. I think that, and and I certainly would. I think you do need a back door, but look, in, given the year that's in it, you would accept. Again, the sacrifices and the little bit of give and take that all the major stakeholders have had to make. But I think you're spot on. I think they're like Christmas is going to change. Uh, the way we celebrate Christmas is going to change. There's an opportunity there, I think, from the GA's perspective to actually, you know, get in on that market. Because one thing that GA clubs will have, and GA, uh, we've got big stadiums, we've got plenty of room. You can celebrate. You can sort of. You can bring people together reasonably safely while still social distancing, which seems it would be with us for a while. Um, no, I wouldn't necessarily be saying that you should be starting the championship in uh, in the first week of November. But if you brought it back to, we'll say September, and you spread it out a little bit more in the build up to Christmas and gave the summer months back to the clubs. Uh, I think I think I think they, they they may be as you said more more by accident than by design. But they may have stumbled upon a big potential solution here, and I think it's definitely something worth thinking about because, you know, like I, the, the intercounty the, the big worry I suppose historically and the reasons why we played the intercounty season in the summer months was because pitches and the quality of the grounds and all of that. But sure, like. The big, the big grounds, the Parky Queeves, Croke Parks, uh, Thurless, Gaelic grounds, um, are the athletic grounds, another fantastic one above an our map. All those pitches are fantastic uh, 365 days a year now. So that shouldn't be as much. So I definitely think there is something in that. 
I don't. I I, I can't see Donald wanting to play play the the Inter County Championship in winter hurling. But it, do you think Donald there could be something in spring and early summer for club and late summer and early autumn for Inter County? Could that work? But like it to me, it's it's people just want certainty. Players yeah. want to know when they're playing, and that's all we all want. And like it goes back to, and I know it mightn't sound that exciting. This is going on with a hundred years. Like I can remember the thousands when I was involved in in Klein and I, I was playing for Cork. I was coaching the the Klein senior team, and players would come and they'd say to the to the management, of which I was part of. Uh, I really need to to know when we're playing the game because uh, I'm under a bit of pressure at home. For example, you know, uh, my partner wants to go away, and they said they, they might ask, "Do you know when we're playing?" And we would say, "No, we actually haven't a clue." And then they'd say, "Okay, so I, need, I have to go back now and say." We can't go away on holidays. And when I'm asked, well, when can we go? I just say, I haven't a clue either. Like, <laughs> all we all want is certainty in terms of the calendar. So anything that helps that, bring it on. We'll, we'll leave it now in a second, Jen. So just go to you, Oshin. Do you, do you think this does seem to be a particularly virile, I won't use that word, it's a, it's a particularly kind of toxic row at the moment, whether it's purely in the media or whether it is seeping out to grassroots. Do you think anything will change in the next couple of years in terms of the club v county relationship, in terms of the calendar? Can you see anything changing? And do you want things to change? I think we all probably want things to change a little. Yeah, no, just on the calendar, I mean, like, I see National League, um, club, uh, and then championship following. I think we can, we, could, we could maybe do that. That gives you an opportunity also to fit in a little bit of college football, which is day in an absolute death at the minute. Um, or Harlan. And, and, um, and, then, and, and an, important, uh, an important asset for the GAA as well, the Sigerson and the Fitzgibbon. Really, really important. Like something that should be protected, you know. So. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and, uh, and as I say, it, it's, it's literally on its last legs. Anybody who's involved in, uh, in college football or Harlem will, will tell you that, you know, it's, it's, it's not a good place to be at the moment. Uh, they've condensed it beyond reproach and like, uh, even just get to get players to commit and, uh, and try and, serve as all the masters at that time of year is almost, is nigh on impossible now. Um, I suppose I keep looking back to club rugby in Ireland, and, and I look at uh, you know how the how the game just sort of died overnight with with, uh, with professionalism. I look at uh, I remember going to a game uh, Dungannon were playing Ballymena on a, on a Saturday. I remember <clears throat> going to that game. You're talking ten, twelve, fifteen thousand people at it. You go today, you've got ten or fifteen people. And uh, it died an absolute death. I think there was, I, I sensed a little bit of a change in that there was a lot of guys who were, as I say, wanting to play into county football. And the, if given the choice, they could leave that the club scene behind. I actually think that has changed in the last uh, six or seven years. I think play, uh, uh, players see the importance of, you know, of, of playing with their club. And I think, uh, you know, the, I don't see this as a row which is going to rumble on uh, as long as we get a handle on it and we keep the lanes of communication open. Uh, I, I, I don't know how Donald Oak feels about it, but I think the GPA has a role to play in this. I think uh, they, they have a massive role as far as, like, you know, if they're not interested in the PR, if they're not interested in uh, how they are viewed by other people, that's that's fine, but they've got to be more proactive and uh, you know as regards um, inter uh, as regards fixtures, as regards um, looking after players, not just what players are doing at inter county level, but when they go back to their clubs, how they're viewed uh, first and foremost, um, and how they approach the game, and I think. There is a bit of a responsibility on the GPA to help lads with that. And I think that would help the whole PR situation hugely. Because as I say, a lot of people uh, at grassroots or, or on the ground have their knife in the GPA and they're not aware of all the good work that's going on. I mean, I've, I've written articles about uh, how positive certain things are within the GPA 
and nobody's ever said anything to me. I've read it, I've written a few which uh, I suppose were quite cutting towards the GPA, and I got an instant reaction to it. And for me, that is for me the way the GPA has changed down through the years, because I was at that initial meeting uh, in the Wally Park and. You can let me know what year it was. I think it was 1999 and around then. Um, and we were all there for the same reason because we wanted things to improve. We, want, we didn't want to be out of pocket. We wanted to be uh, looked after in certain ways. That wasn't happening at that time. The GPA have come in and that has happened. The mental health side of things, they are all over that. I can't, I can't tell you how good that has been. But when people hear figures bandied about the GPA is getting X, 2.5 million or whatever, that's the thing that really rails people at, at grassroots and the people who are going to watch club games or the volunteers and all that sort of thing. And, and you know what? If, you break, if, if, if somebody would just break those figures down or show these people what's going on, I mean, I think that people will be a lot more accepting of what's going on within the GPA. And, and as a consequence of that, uh, the, the way the GPA is viewed would be a lot better than what it is at this moment in time. But, the, the, final, but the, final point, the final point, Rory, is, is, the, is, the, is, the, is the helping players out, okay? How players are viewed. Because it's not just the GPA now, it's how the inter-county lads swans back into the club. How often have you heard that? Do you know, and inter-county players can be helped with that. They're getting helped in so many ways, but from a PR point of view, for the GPA at the moment, it does seem to be a bit of a disaster. So instead of being reactive to things, maybe a little bit more proactive. I mean, they should have been all over all over this stuff at the minute. You know, the, uh, the inter-county fixtures, the, the whether you can go back to train. I mean, they should be dictated. I think... The GPA should be in there dictating a lot of what goes on there. So, Logie, you, you, you were very heavily involved in a, in, a, in a GPA that was a campaigning, you know, and almost, let me, I just played the CPA's militant earlier, you know, that's maybe a little bit unfair, but the GPA were that they were, they were in the GA's face and you got things done by a variety of methods. Do you, do you think that there is a time, that there's since the time maybe for the GPA to go back to that a little bit, be a little bit more combative? You think this is something that they should be getting involved with? In? Yeah, but like I don't necessarily disagree with anything that that Ocean has said there, but I, I do know like the GPA are, are all over that. Every day they're they're stuck in this argument. They were on, on on the committee to to represent players as best as they possibly could, but like they're only one stakeholder. And like the, the other thing I would say is that like the there was a major issue in terms of how players were so badly treated, and I would say almost exploited. That was a real image problem that the that the GA, the GPA came in, solved that. The GA recognised it. That's why that funding is, is is made available. And I was actually just looking, and like it's interesting. And I'd say to anyone that's listening to this, bring up the GPA, ask them, go out, talk to Paul Flynn. Very be, be, be more than happy. But like I was looking at some of the the figures. From, from last year even, right? And I, I've written down here in front of me, like there was 1,500 individual players went through the GPA last year. 2,220 programs delivered. Like, there's a lot of serious, serious work going on there. But the other point I'd make as well is that, and it's in no way making an excuse, the GPA have made massive strides over the last number of years. Massive in terms of addressing all the issues that Oisin spoke about that existed very much in our day, to use that term. But the GPA are still a young organisation. They're still finding their way. They will evolve. They will move with the times. They will take on uh, new challenges. But, and, and I believe that they will meet those they, and get, get better and better and continuously get better and better. Um, but like, I, I think one of the biggest challenges there is I'm not so sure people want to hear about the good work that the, the GPA are doing because it doesn't necessarily make the headlines and it doesn't necessarily, you know, give you easy rounds of applause on, on, social, or on social media or up your hits if you're actually, and, and what O'Sheen said there was testament to it. But 
I would say that the GPA are all over this argument from what I know, okay? Mm. But it mightn't be as much in the public domain as maybe people would like. Don't log. Would you would you agree with the with the with the with the PR thing or the public perception? I mean, like if you if you look at the, the there, very is there top an image top, problem. Is there an image yeah. problem? Yeah. If you if you look at the very top and you look at the very bottom and the GPA seem to be sandwiched in the middle. I mean, like in the north, uh, there's a lot of organisations which have been disbanded over the last number of years. A lot of serious organisations. People are talking about disbanding the GPA. You know, I'm waiting for somebody to say that. I'm waiting for somebody to tell them to decommission. Do you know what I mean? Like, like they don't even. Have, as far as I, as far as I know, to my knowledge, they don't have any arms. But if they do, it's because because you know, disband is quite a. It's quite hefty. Like when 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 yeah. you, when you think about it, it's quite it's quite you know hefty language to use around an organisation that's supposed to be helping players. You know. Yeah, but O'Shea, does people talk about disbanding the RTE within the government? Do you know what I mean? It doesn't necessarily mean that that, 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 that should happen. And I'm sure you wouldn't get agreement here, right? But, like, does anybody, does anybody want things to go back to the way they were, where players were not represented? All those things that we were talking about were not happening. Players weren't getting expenses. Players that were getting injured weren't being looked after. Like, does anybody want to go back to those days? In answer to your question, the pr the probably is. There's probably a lot of people that you know outside of the inter county players and and the families who know what they're going through. There's probably a lot of people out there who I think, you know, if you said that to them, they'd say, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So Oshin, yeah. exactly. That's the right the reason for long long live the GPA, right? <laughs> <laughs> if, we want to, if we want to get into that territory. Long live the GPA and may they for a very long time be looking after the uh, the welfare of players. And of course, it's not perfect. Of course, there's areas that could get better in. But I would say to anybody, anybody that's in the media or anything like that, bring up Paul Flynn, go and see actually what's happening within the association and give the constructive feedback. No better person and no better group of people who just want to serve the organisation. Like what motivated, it goes back to again, what motivated you to go to that meeting uh, back in Oshin? What, what, what motivated me? What motivated a lot of our, of our colleagues to invest our time into it? We just wanted what was best for the players. And I think that's a, I think that's a really noble cause and one that should be uh, celebrated um, rather than the opposite. I, I feel I have to ask this question of everybody because it just it, there's a perception. And again, we're only going on perceptions because I have no massive opinion on the GPA but you do get a perception that they've, they've gone from being kind of the uh, rabble-rousing, you know, the, the guys upturning tables and causing problems for the suits in Crow Park to being the suits in Crow Park, don't know. That, that's probably part of it. But on the flip side, by the sounds of it, do you think if inter-county players threaten to strike over something like the 14th of September, say, no, we're going to listen to Crow Park, we're going to... Do you think there would be support for county players or have county players become almost a body, a body of people who people don't want to hear, hear their opinions? Is that a harsh thing to say? So, Mikey, in reality, right, the, 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 the GPA represents the inter-county player, right? There's 2,000 inter-county players within the association. Every one of yourselves here, right, know the challenge that that brings, right? when you are seen to be representing a small number of people, you are going to face all of what gets thrown at the GPA. It is like that, that's, that comes with the territory of representing what's considered a minority and is uh, a smaller number within the association. Mm, okay. Oshin, you went to that meeting in 1999. Were you expecting to be joining a, a militant union? And were you happy with how they kind of the bit, how they went about their business for those first few years and when you got expenses, when you got what you were looking for, did you expect them to kind of slink away or do you think the GPA should still have the ability to mobilise like another, like a union and call a strike if that's what is called for? Yeah, no, I, look, at, in 1989 it was, it was slightly different because you're trying to kick down a door. Uh, that door doesn't need to be kicked down anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, 
they've been welcomed in the Crow Park. I've sat on the committee with, with representatives from the GPA and and very much they get the point across and they're listened to and, and it's it's taken on board the same way as as uh, the other people in, in that room. Uh, I, I just like maybe at times when needed that do, do you know kick up a bit of a stink, make a little bit more noise. You know, when the fixtures come out, not complain about them, but to have to be more forthright about uh, what exactly you want, rather than you know, because because that was that was the as as far as I could see, you know, that was the case for a number of years. In that, you know, we seen uh, fixtures coming out, and GPA would say, well, "We didn't agree to that." We had we had a survey. Here's the sort. The survey says sixty percent of our players didn't want this, but at that stage, the horse is bolted. Do you know what I mean? They, they, they can't have a, there's no say at that stage. Whereas if you're sitting in that committee, that's when you can have the impact. Whether that takes a strike or whether that takes throwing, it, throwing the toys out of the pram or whatever it is, if you feel that strongly about something, well, then you cannot let... Uh, if you feel as if the, your playing population, the majority of your playing population, are not going to be happy with something, then you need to be more forthright in those main rather than to, if you can continue to bow down all the time well then you're only going to get to the stage where we're at where people think well they've got inside the doors now and you know they're happy they're happy with their lot they're happy with their their uh with what they're getting as far as finances and, and as far as they're saying in what's happening but you know uh, from the outside looking in it doesn't look as if there's much uh Toys being thrown out of the pram or kicking and stomping them, whatever. Um, you know the the real issues need to be need to be uh, need to be sorted out. And the biggest issue in the GEA has been fixtures for some time. And the CPA have, have talked more about fixtures uh, since they have been. Uh, I, I don't know how long they're around. A couple of years maybe, but they have talked more about fixtures. I mean, more sense about fixtures than the GPA have in in twenty odd years. Well, Sheen, the GPA didn't travel the journey. They tra travelled from that meeting you went to in 1999 and get to the stage they're at now when all of those services are there for players because they were continuously bowing down. And you know that. Well, I'm not, I'm not saying that. I, you know, there was, there, was, there, was, there was rebel rousing, there was kicking down the door. And that's, that has, yeah, I must admit that that has stopped now. And Oshin, and, 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 and I'm telling you, right, I'm telling you that you know that well, right, that there was a lot of, there was a lot of hard work, hard arguments, hard yards put in by a lot of volunteers. I do get what you're saying around that perception. But if an agreement is made, of which there is an agreement in place between the GPA and the GNO, then you need to align to some of that agreement. Of course you do, right? That, that just comes with the territory. We, we, we all wanted to get to the stage where there was a certain provision of finance from the association that could be put in place for the players that is there now, that wasn't there previously for all the right reasons that we're saying. So there's a pay, the payoff for being yeah, inside the tent is that you, you, you kind of lose the ability or you lose the power to as the analogy we keep using, kick over the tables. I get the point that's been made. Like, yeah. it's, it's, no, it's not as if that, uh, that I, 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 I haven't been, you know, involved in, in, in that territory over the years, right, of, of fighting for the, uh, the player. But I also get the point that with, when you get rights, you get responsibilities. And I'm in full agreement. And I, I, I don't think the, I don't think that um, like if I meet a player and lots of players would have heard me say, saying this right if I meet a club player and they give out about the, uh, the fixtures I ask them two questions I say number one did you join the CPA right and number two did you contact your club secretary right if and so I, I think that most are, are the, the diff, there's very little difference in position between the GPA and the CPA and I think the CPA are dead right I signed up for the CPA myself because I believe that the fixtures issues need to be addressed absolutely okay well 
I have to say I've thoroughly enjoyed this. You know, we, we came on to talk about rows and we ended up having a little bit of a row ourselves, which probably is, uh, yeah, listen, <laughs> as, it, as it should be. Um, that, like, wasn't, that wasn't a row, Mikey. No, 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 that, that, wasn't wasn't row. Yeah. that was a broadcastable <laughs> row. I gotta, it's a row in the world of broadcasting. I know it's not a we didn't. Nobody kicked over a table, I don't think. So it's not a proper row, but it was a <laughs> like, row. Considering how much rowing is going on, it was probably no hand that we threw one into the mix. <laughs> so, I'd like to say thank you to Oshin, Rory and Dolog, and I will be back shortly with an interview with Joan Henchy, Chairperson of New York County Board. All right, Cheers. Lads. Cheers, boys. Thanks, lads. Good Good face. That was Enjoy great. That. Well done. Cheers, Take guys. Care, All the best. Cheers. Bye-bye. 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 Don't look on that point if it's a matter of perception. Do you think the GPA have helped themselves, have contributed to the argument in the last couple of weeks? You know, they released a statement saying that there's a sustained negative discourse surrounding intercounty players. They're trying to walk a tightrope and saying that there should be insurance cover for before the 14th of September, but also are saying that there should be no training before the 14th of September. Do you think they've been constructive in this argument thus far? Okay, I'm delighted to say I'm joined by the chairperson of New York County Board, Joan Henchy. How are you doing, Joan? Very good, Mikey. I hope all is well with you. Yeah, we're, we're, we're getting somewhere back to normal on this side of the Atlantic. And well, the headlines are great from America, but we do know that New York, at, at, once, at one point, the epicenter of this whole thing. Yeah. It's looking a little bit better. I, I was reading about today, 25,000 deaths from the 130,000 deaths total in yeah. America. But... It's looking a lot better. I think you've had four or five days straight with less than 900 hospitalizations now, which is really good. You were just saying the testing has been cranked up. But then on the other hand, I see that uh, Mayor de Blasio has kind of delayed the, um, the, uh, the right to dine indoors, indoors for a week yeah. or two. Just, so the, the trend is good, but there's still a little bit of nervousness. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I think everybody's extremely cautious. Um, I mean, look, I mean, I feel really, really bad for the businesses that were relying on the indoor dining and were had plans in place and had taken all the necessary precautions and changes and then to get that shut down. But um, I mean, I guess erring on the side of caution, um, it kind of has to be done, I suppose. I Like I said, I'd hate to be a business person in the city right now, especially after being locked down for four and a half months. But I think the weekend that we're coming into, um, it's a big weekend. It's a it's a big holiday weekend. We, you know, I think they're worried about the complacency more than they are anything. And then ultimately looking around the country, and seeing like the likes of Florida and parts of California, um, and it's not been taken as serious. Obviously, I have to say I'm very happy with the way the governor of New York handled the whole thing. Yeah, and you, you actually hear the governor uh, while well, he's coming out the last couple of days, kind of. Not gloating, but kind of saying, you know, a lot of those southern states were laughing at us and how we how we were yeah. trying to deal with it, saying we were overreacting. It was a democratic hoax, all this. Yeah, stuff. we're so yeah. liberal in New York, and yeah, yeah. yeah and now you now you see that the travel has been banned from oh, Mississippi, Texas, Florida, yeah. the Carolinas, a lot oh, of the places where golf is being played. <laughs> they can stay there. They can stay there. They can stay there. Stay away from us. So, you know, it's it's it has to it has to be because it's, you know if we had a national mandate and one national plan, which is why I admire Ireland so well. I mean, if you look at what you've done as an island, um, in the middle of trying to form a government and the leadership that was shown, and I mean, people are going to have their issues. You know, one person's one politics, the other. But take a look at the overall picture and how you handled the entire situation we don't have that no, no we don't yeah. have that we don't have a, ma a national mandate it has been we, we complain that there's not kind of one clear message around things like face masks but there's the, the gravity of the situation was was very well the message was put out yeah. there and the, the the face masks came down to the fact that certain scientists and doctors couldn't agree but when we look at the states you've got the executive arm of the government mm -hmm. disagreeing with individual governors on how they deal with things and it seems some states in a hurry to reopen which obviously new york isn't it? new york is the biggest or second biggest economy in, in the united states probably after california and 
You're not in a rush to reopen. And that seems to be vindicated at this stage. It does. And I think people, as much and all as was frustrating, and again, going back to the business people that own um, large you know, businesses in the city, I mean, their rents are not, they're not cheap by any means. Um, and like I said, I worry for them, but um, they don't want a second shutdown. Ooh. You know, they certainly don't want their business hampered because we couldn't wear a face mask. Put it on. You know, I, it's 100 degrees outside. You don't like wearing clothes either. You have to wear them. Put the mask on. It's a simple, it's a simple thing. If that came from federal government down, you know, we know it works. Um, again, like I said, they're not, you know, they're not the most comfortable to wear, but you wear them. You have to walk into a store. Or you have to, you know, get out of your car and pump gas. Put it on. Yeah. It, you take it right back off. You come back in your house, you, you, you know, you take it off. So it's, it's, you're being respectful to other people as well as yourself. Mm. And I think it's the only way to go right now. So given that level of compliance, which is good, but could be better according to your governor and the fact that the, all the trends are going in the right direction, but there's still a bit of nervousness. What's the state of play with the GAA? Obviously, we know you've no club, the county row to be getting on with because you were removed from the Connacht Championship mm. and you spoke this week sensibly saying it was the only decision that could be made. You've, you've come to terms with that. So your focus now is on the club game. Have you been able to arrange a championship? Yes. Um, so we spent, I mean, you got to love Zoom meetings, but sometimes they don't necessarily <laughs> work. So thank God for Gaelic Park, where you can have an actual meeting with your management and stuff and spread out. I mean, the place is huge. But um, yeah, I have to say the, the New York uh, management and CCC, and we've met and we've had numerous meetings. Um, so we, you know, took the New York, or the, obviously the GA template with regards reopening and stuff, but we had to, we can't take that. Um, we had to obviously edit that and work with the New York state guidelines um, because we're not in the same region as you. Yeah. Um, so using that template and stuff and put together a, a 10 page reopening document and putting necessary um, procedures in place and obviously common sense regulations as opposed to rule, we had to do it this year. Um, we sent out an email to the clubs before we started and we asked um, what their thought process was. Would they be interested in playing? And we got a resounding yes. So from there, we moved forward and we put together a plan and watching the phases and where we are, obviously, <laughs> GAA Gaelic Games would not be recognized under state governance. So you have to figure out where you fall in under recreational sport. So we're somewhere between soccer and basketball. So we fall somewhere between phase three and phase four. We're not quite four. We're phase three, but we might be phase three and a half. Okay. So we erred on the side of caution and pushed closer to the phase four. Um, what phase are you in right now? We're in three. You're in three. You, so. where we're in three on the sixth. So soccer, the 6th is, soccer is back next week. Sixth of July, recreational sports. No collagics, no college, no mm -hmm. uh, you know, schools or anything else, but recreational, yes. So we're classified under that. Um, you wouldn't say that in Ireland, that we're recreational. That's, you know, <laughs> that, that's just blasphemy, but uh, yeah, here we are. Um, but yeah, so we, we fall somewhere in there. So we decided to, to push and, and obviously err on the side of caution as well to allow a little bit more time. Um, and then also adding, you know, taking that 14 days from the 4th of July as well. Mm -hmm. So we're back on the 17th in and around um, and that's the plan provided nothing changes and if something shifts and changes we'll have to roll with it and go with it but at least we have a schedule it's very condensed very mm. fast it's just, I mean, we're just championship no league just championship it? and it'll be straight rounds and there won't be too many in the line of qualifiers and stuff so it'll be like semi-final and final you know if you're not in the top three or four you know you're off the schedule and stuff and then obviously the protocols that we've had to put in place are, are, are pretty intense because we're very large board. Mm. I mean, under the senior jurisdiction, we have 40 teams, which we're running. Um, and, you know, we have a team in Connecticut. We have two teams in Jersey. Um, and we have players throughout the tri-state area, and they're traveling. So we've tried to be as smart as we possibly can. Um, I know our neighbors in Boston and Philly yeah, would love if there could be some type of a competition, because obviously they're, they're not as large a board. Um, but we're not going to run the risk of having players coming in from outside the tri-state area, nor do we want our players traveling outside the tri-state area. 
Okay. So you're running, is it a group? Is it kind of a round robin, first first round and then quarters, semifinals, finals kind of thing? Uh, with the senior championship, it's there's only five teams there anyway. Um, so it's an easy enough one, top teams to the final, team two versus three for a semi. Uh, intermediate, similar, there's four okay. teams, top four. Junior, the same. Junior B is the same. And our hurling this year, all right, is a little bit different. We decided there's six teams there um, because a couple of teams have both junior and senior. And because we don't have sanctions coming or we don't, a lot of our, a lot of our visa holders during the course of the lockdown returned home. Um, and they're still very much at the mercy of our reopening there. Um, so it's not to put pressure on them and, and, and that we allowed the teams to amalgamate into one team for just this particular year. So we're down to six instead of eight teams at the moment. So everybody gets a chance at playing for the senior cup. So it's the top three will qualify for that and then the, the bottom three for junior. But everyone gets a crack at the at the senior cup, which is in, which is good because we have a lot of young Irish American that are playing junior hurling. So the idea of putting the 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 biggest prize in front of them is is intriguing so i mean I, i'm looking forward to that that's fantastic. that's really interesting i talked to you about that another day the uh there's a little bit of a certain kind of a celtic revival is it young yeah. american taking up yeah. hurling rather than football well it's it's you know we've been working um my former chairman lawrence mcgraw was very very good with me he gave me a lot he gave me car blanche really with with the county development and stuff and um, with our two county development officers, Mickey Quigg, obviously, and um, Simon, you know, just strategically trying to figure out, okay, well, you know, we have such a huge turnover on our senior inter-county players. And that has, that's not sustainable anymore. And what can we do? How can we do it? You know, and we started these county development squads to the point that we started it four years ago now. We now have 14, 16s. Um, and then obviously the county development squad, we had seven of those young lads were going to actually make the starting 15 for the Galway game, which is really exciting. Um, and to see them because they're there, it's yeah. there, it's just tapping in on it. And instead of having 80% turnover of players, now we'll only have 20% because these are home-based players. Nobody, that jersey means as much to them, that New York jersey, as it would to a young man in Kerry or Dublin. That's their county jersey. Right. So, and we're not, going to be as reliant on the on, on on the transient player basically yeah on the other hand i did read a report i think it was on the 42 talking about the the longford longford new york and how they they said they might struggle to put out a team or at least a competitive team mm -hmm. without the you know the summer transient you know the, the irish guys coming over yeah obviously everybody's in the same boat this year so there's nobody has a, an influx of players so it has there been any of the senior or intermediate football clubs who are struggling to, to field the team um no um they all managed we have a draft system here um okay. so if you play on a, um, a junior division you can draft up to intermediate or senior and you're restricted on the number of players you're allowed five or six 50% of them must be American born. And again, it was, it's to encourage the clubs to, to, to rely on the home base team as well. But our dependency on sanctions has reduced mm. by 60% in the last five years. Right. Um, so that's not there. But with regards to the transient player coming out on a visa who's transferring out here, yeah, the, the, a lot of clubs are reliant on that to a point. But I think the message that we've been trying to put across to them about being a standalone and working and building towards a home base and, and, and not being so reliant on that player um, is very evident this year, how important mm. it is. Um, and I'm hoping that transcends and going forward, the clubs will realise, you know, look, the kids are here. We've 2,600 kids registered at underage. You know, I get the outside sports. I get the you know, distractions with American football and soccer and basketball lacrosse and you name it and scholarships and all the rest of it. But it's, an, it, it, it's, it's imperative that we work and holding that core of 25 or 30% who are staying here and make them part of and uh, showing how valuable they are. Yeah. And, even and if, for a lot of reasons. Yeah. Even if there wasn't a pandemic, of course, the, the number of sanctions coming in would probably have been down this year because of the ban on J1s until the end of 2020 at least. Um, obviously it sounds like that's not something you're terribly worried about 
you you're happy that New York GEA can stand on its own two feet without the need for you know plane loads of yeah. Irish lads coming over for the summer. Yeah, uh, from from a GEA perspective, yes. I mean, from an Irish perspective, and for somebody who's been involved in the Irish immigration reform here for the last thirty years, um, I'm concerned mm. about it. Um, I'm very concerned with the fact that it's legal immigration that has been stopped. Um, we spent probably half of those 30 years trying to get these visas. Mm. Um, there was such a fast pull without any consultation with any of the coalitions with regards to these visas. So there is serious concern for us right now um, from an Irish perspective and obviously from, you know, some of these kids come out here and fall in love with the place and are looking towards futures here and stuff. Um, and to be able to do that legally is very important. Um, I'm sure you're all sick of listening to me ranting on about Slauncher 2020 this year, um, but five groups of us got together to assist and help um, our own people keep a roof over their head and food in their bellies and looking after children. Um, and it's it, it's been an emotional roller coaster on that particular one. We had probably 80 over 80 percent of the applicants were undocumented mm. that's not good enough that's not good enough for our own people we don't want to go back there mm. we don't need to go back there leave the legal visa in place a, a lot of our h1s and other visa holders returned home and i don't know if the irish people are aware of this and i don't know if people in general are aware of this you're a legal resident in this country on a visa you're considered a guest you pay taxes. You're not eligible for unemployment benefits. Right. No, I was unaware that, of that. Okay, that's we saw that in such a huge scale this year. Wow. These are people that are paying the brightest of the brightest on H1s, the brightest of the brightest, going into tech companies. They're very important for high tech companies. They offer them the visa. The visa provides the health insurance. So companies, it's a win-win for them. They don't have to provide healthcare. Um, Americans are not taking these entry level positions because they're looking for jobs with healthcare. So the tech companies went all over the place. These kids, these young men and women are not eligible for unemployment benefits, even though they're paying into our tax system. Wow. They had to return home and they're on hold as well now, which is very unfortunate, which is why I think Longford were more concerned about that than they were about the J1 student coming in. They had a number of their players who have been here for a couple of years on H1B visas, which can be five to three to five years. And most people apply for um, green card after that and so on and so forth. But they had to return and they're in limbo land at the moment. And their yeah. job is sitting here waiting. That's crazy. So I have a little visitor. It, it is. seems to be the trend at the moment. Uh, so like... pulling a plug on a visa like that without any consultation to any of the any of the coalitions that are working with immigrants um, was just a, a very it was a big knee jerk reaction. So yeah, on that point, um, I was just interested in the community response within the pandemic uh, with New York GEA because obviously there's huge economic and financial repercussions, possibly more severe than they are over here because of what we were just discussing. In Ireland, a lot of GA clubs got heavily involved in delivering food to people who were cocooning, uh, you know, kind of food food drives, this kind of thing, you know, anything and everything. Um, so I was kind of wondering what was the response in New York within the GA community? Um, they're unbelievable. They're, I just don't have the words to thank our clubs, our members, our supporters for what they did. Um, we raised over $120,000 in four months to help our own people in need. Um, and that's, I think a total of 500,000 was raised, a half a million um, in that time frame, And we contributed over 120,000 to that, which is phenomenal considering a lot of our own people were directly affected. The hospitality sector took a, a, probably the biggest hit. Mm. Um, even those people that were legal that may have been working off the books, um, you know, Unfortunately, it's a life learning uh, situation for them now. You know, they'll have to take a look at having to put something into taxes. I mean, but, you know, at the end of the day, there was no benefits coming in, nothing, savings gone, um, no way of regaining it. So, I mean, 
just that one phone call to the county management team and they rode in behind me in two minutes. Um, and Johnny McGinney and Johnny Glynn didn't just do a 5K, they did a 1,000K, um, which was tremendous. And the, our boys were just not one off the panel. I was 45 took place and took part in it. They were just amazing. And then Mickey Quigg did a strike for Slauncha. Um, they had to do, I, don't know, I can't even remember how many strikes off. So I had to open Gaelic Park and we had them strategically placed around the place, hitting the slitter off a wall. Um, and people wondering what the heck is going on here. But, um, and they contributed as well. And amazingly enough, um, and I won't mention the names because I have a, confidentiality agreement uh, <laughs> with Slauncha anyway but um, I wouldn't give their names anyway but four of those young men that did the strike for Slauncha were recipients of the fund and they gave right back oh wow um, I don't know if I can say um, okay I can I guess there was one young man he happened to be and this is a very very funny story um, he was the very first applicant to the fund he happens to be a member of one of our clubs <laughs> and he got assistance first applicant first first check and got back to work a little bit sooner than most because there was um i guess they were able to do the uh, takeout um orders and curbside pickup or whatever you want to call it yeah so he decided to help us back and he wanted to raise five thousand dollars and he came up with the <laughs> the most unique fundraising idea i'd ever heard of um you may have to edit this it was called chicken shit bingo no i won't need to edit that carry on okay <laughs> so a hundred boxes framed out with straw numbered one through 100 you bought a box for a hundred dollars 50 percent of it first prize winner and the other 50 percent went to slauncha and he needed the chicken to poop in one of those boxes and whatever box the chicken pooped in you were the winner so he did a trial run on friday night and the trial run ended with the chicken pooping on two sides but not quite in the center of any box and got up the next morning she'd laid an egg <laughs> so i don't know where the chicken is now but anyway we finally he finally got it done anyway and there was a five thousand dollar donation back into the fund and he was the very first recipient but where he came up with chicken shit bingo is beyond me, but we never laughed so hard in our lives and we really needed that giggle at that particular time. But um, it just shows you that Irish pride is a killer. Mm. Irish pride is horrible. Um, you'd lose a limb before you'd ask for help. Yeah. Um, and, and, and telling people that it was okay. But to see those people wanting to give back because they got that was, is tremendous. So, you know, the GA family is just phenomenal and, you know, I know we have our critics and so on and so forth, but I dare one of them to challenge us on when it comes to family, we know what it means. Yeah. Uh, just finally then, I guess it, it, nobody can ignore the fact that it's been a tumultuous few months around the world, but in America, it's been more tumultuous again, George Floyd, Black Lives Matter. And it's been a tumultuous four years <clears throat> in America. And I was just wondering, yeah. from the perspective of a, a member of the Irish community in New York, it, do you feel the country has changed over the last four years? Do you, uh, like, and what, what do you hope for or expect from the upcoming election? Because I wouldn't normally ask somebody who comes on GA podcast this question, but it's quite clear that you, know, you have views on matters of society and immigration, and I would imagine politics. So I'm happy enough to ask you. I don't feel I put you on the spot. Uh, well, my father was a senator for 20 something odd years. So politics kind of runs in the blood. Um, I'm going to refrain from being very blunt. <laughs> um, anyone that knows me knows I'm not a fan of the current administration. Um, I feel the country is very divided. I feel that people's opinions can't be taken as just that. Um, if you have if you don't agree, you're ostracized to a point. Um, it should be taken just as is. Um, sometimes there's very little wiggle room. Um, and when you know that the situation or the administration's after making a wrong move and you say it, um, you're not allowed to say it. 
Um, and I feel that it's caused a lot of tensions and I see it in various parts of social media and stuff. Um, uh, and I don't like, however, however, luckily for us, we're not, it doesn't, does not come into, it does not come into play within the GEA, but within the Irish community, yeah, it does. And I have very strong views on, on the, the, the administration. Like I said, I'm not a fan and I'm very concerned about the legal uh, immigration status. And, and I mean, we have to take a really strong look at a lot of situations here. I don't like what's happening right now with the, with, with our cops. I don't like the, the backlash because it's a very small percentage of, of, of people that maybe not right for the job. Mm versus the majority of them are. Um, I understand the frustrations um, that African-American people or people of color feel. I totally understand it. I get it. Um, we're immigrants ourselves. Um, I've been told on numerous occasions, go back to my own country. Hello, I was born here. I'm in it. <laughs> I consider Ireland home though. Yeah. Um, but because I speak with an Irish accent, go back to where you belong. Um, so you get you you get it, um, and you get a little bit thick skinned with with a lot of it. Um, however, I am very concerned. We have um, a little bit of a task force in place. Uh, we'll be doing a youth forum hopefully in the fall, um, where we have I, I'm sure you know Aaron Cunningham. Mm -hmm. um, Aaron has um, is getting on board with me. Um, conversation was had with Aaron, um, and thankfully he's not incurred any animosities or any racial slurs or anything like that he's been considered one of our own um in and on and around gaelic park and on the field so you know i'm very very grateful for that um but we have a number of our members are cops so sorry my phone is is ringing there but um um i'm very grateful to say that the um a couple of our nypd officers and aaron are going to join us and we're going to have a little conversation with our youth and stuff but yeah so i mean the concept is to to you know make sure that we have open dialogue um because we do have an awful lot of our members that are married to to, to women of color and, and and men of color and i want them to know that they're very much part of our our of our ga society and they're very part of part of our com community and they're welcome and they want and want it and i want our children those children to know our games and i want them to play and I think it's awful important that we start that now. We don't seem to have the issue. However, I don't want to, I want to make sure we don't. Um, so it's a start in the right direction and having these open communications and showing that someone like Aaron can play alongside two lads that are wearing a, 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 a police officer's uniform and can coexist and there's respect and, um, and that this is doable and that, you know, we as the GA don't accept and will not put up with, and we will not tolerate any of it. Um, and I think it's important to do that now. Um, but, you know, right now the tensions are very, very high. Yeah. Very, very high. I said, at the, I said at the start, you don't have a club v county row to, to, to occupy at the moment, but it sounds like you have plenty else to occupy you and it's, it's, yeah. it's not quite the, the average county board chairperson role, it doesn't sound. No, I suppose. But then when you're in exile, you kind of really don't. I mean, you know, it's, it's you're working or you're involved at some level. And the GAA outside of Ireland, um, we're very much the largest organization outside of, outside of Ireland. Um, so, I mean, people, immigrants and, and, and our own people, they gravitate towards the GAA. So, you know, we're networking for work and for, you know, housing or whatever it is. Somebody knows somebody. And even in, cracks me up in my own house. Um, you need anything done. Can't call a contractor. Stop. I know a fella. <laughs> and that fella knows a fella. But they're yeah. all Irish. You know, yeah. everybody's Irish. You, you just, it's just who we are. Um, and I think that's very, it's very evident in, in, in New York. And, and throughout the United States, wherever there's a, a GA organization, they pull towards it. Um, so we're very blessed on that level, I think, too, because we're very, you know, the broader community gravitates to us and, and we are leaders here um, and we do need to set that example and we do need to set that right tone. And it's very important that, you know, we're streetwise to everything that's going on and not just put blinkers on and just think these things are not existing. Um, just let's make sure they're not. Okay. 
Joan, it's been a pleasure talking to you and uh, wish you all the best with your championship and with everything else you have going on there because and, and like fingers, you've got a lot fingers, crossed, fingers crossed you let us back home soon. <laughs> fingers crossed. Um, thank you very much to Joan and I'd just like to say thank you to all my other guests this week and uh, if you don't subscribe to the podcast, please do. And if you found us on YouTube, you know, maybe make a nice comment or go find how you can subscribe to the podcast and do that. Um, we will be back next week. Don't miss uh, Saturday and Sunday Sport on Radio 1. Uh, we'll have all the news and GA and sport and otherwise on the RTE website. And the Sunday game is back again this Sunday night. So I'll just leave it at that now and see you again next week. Thank you. Possession crucial from this. How much longer will the referee allow? Dublin lead by a point. And there's the whistle. It's over. We earned it by winning the last two matches on the road, and that's not going to be taken away from us. But what I love in Hurland, I love players that will never give in. He hits it, he hits it, it's over the bar!